Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tom Boyke. I'm the uh, director of the Global Health Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. This is an event on advancing the SDGs through equity. Uh, if either of those pieces of information are a surprise to you, you're in the wrong place. Um, let me start with a question to frame this topic. Should your zip code predetermine your health and well-being? Should your race, should your gender, should your ethnicity uh, predetermine your health and well-being? Uh, well, with the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, the United Nations, and its 193 member states answer those questions firmly no. <clears throat> Uh, the core principle of the SDGs, of the 17 SDGs, is equity, leaving no one behind. Uh, SDG uh, number three, the goal number three, is ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being uh, for all at all ages. SDG five is achieving gender equality for all women and girls. Uh, SDG 10 is reducing inequality both within countries and among countries. SDG 17 is improving the data where we can track these subgroups on ethnicity, on race, on gender, on age, migratory status, disability, geographic location, allowing us to have a better sense of the progress we're making, not just overall at a national average level, but for, for individual groups so that we leave no one behind. Uh, We've committed, as the world, the international community has committed to the achievement of these goals by 2030. And today we have an excellent panel to talk about whether or not we are on the road uh, to fulfilling that progress, achieving the SDGs, and addressing the inequity that separates the lucky from the unlucky. Um, to save time, I am going to grossly truncate their very impressive biographies that you already have in your materials. Apologies for doing that in advance. I'm going to start to my immediate left. Ruth Berg is the managing partner at Palladium, where she leads the health practice for the Americas. Patrick Fine is the Chief Executive Officer of FHI 360, a nonprofit human development organization dedicated to improving lives in lasting ways by advancing integrated, locally driven solutions. Uh, Melissa <laughs> Coppolo McCall is the Global Director for Policy at Anheuser Busch InBev, where she leads the com company's multilateral engagement and on the SDGs in particular. And for this group, let's start with this panelist. Uh, so the SDGs, as we mentioned, are inclusive. They call for engagement across ages, genders, ethnicities, and across sectors. This is a sea change from the Millennium Development Goals. It's a sea change from the way we've traditionally uh, approached global health with targeted interventions to address specific diseases. How is, what has your organizations done to adopt this inclusive, integrated approach? How has it changed the way you do business, and are you making progress with that approach? Let's start with you. Start with me. Okay, um, so as you said, this is sort of a new era, and the SDGs have really provided a framework, I think, for all of us to think more broadly about how to achieve important results in health regarding equity. and. The, uh, especially with these 17 indicators, goals rather, when we think about health, they remind us that a lot of times to achieve health outcomes, the, the ones that we desire and the ones that are in the targets of SDG3, we actually have to think beyond that specific goal beyond the health sector. And that's what the SDGs are really reminding of, uh, us of. And so as a company, uh, we have really embraced that idea and uh, I'd like to just show a quick slide here about how we work cross-sectorially. Um, because it's really important, I can't underscore this enough. Um, as you know, um, those of you who work in the United States, it's like the social determinants. Uh, so instead of just working within the health sector, you're really working around it as well. But this is very new for the development community. So what this slide is showing here is that uh, we have partnered in uh, northern Nigeria where we have a very large integrated health program doing very traditional work in health system strengthening and that's how we normally work in health. That's what we're funded to do in this case by USAID. But um, knowing the limitations of that, we reached out to Power Africa which is an initiative also funded by USAID. 
And you'll be happy to hear this, Melissa. It was over a beer that we cooked up this idea <laughs> um, that in Abuja, with input from our stakeholders on the ground, that really to have a, a, a really good health impact, in this case, on reducing maternal and infant deaths in northern Nigeria in rural and remote areas, and this is where the equity really comes into play, we have to think beyond just training the midwives and improving the facilities. Because if we just train the midwives and we just improve the facilities, that's not solving problems of clean water and of electricity and roads, which all have an impact on health. So if we only focus on the health system, we're missing that. So in this case, we partnered with um, Power for Africa, as I said, and we are providing electricity both on-grid and off-grid in remote and rural areas, partnering with them. Now, that is what USAID agreed to fund. The trick is always getting someone else to fund the other pieces, and that's where we are. Uh, we also want to bring in water and agriculture into this, in this, into this work. So, just leave it there. Great. Uh, Patrick, you, I feel in your description of your organization that you have, uh, you've really laid your cards on the table already about an integrated approach uh, across sectors. So I'd love to hear um, how, how you all are doing this, but also to pick up on Ruth's point about funding being very targeted to goals still, uh, to specific programs. So even if you have an inclusive approach and want to pursue it, how do you get funders to come along with that? And I would love to hear that. Thank right, you. great. Uh, thanks, and hi, everyone. So FHI 360 has, A, been working towards uh, programs that increase equity for a long time. Um, so having the SDGs um, make equity, not just in health, but across the board, is a key unifying theme of the global goals for the next, fit, well, until 2030, is great. Um, it, it is affirms what we have worked on for a long time. And we also, we're a very diverse organization. We work in 61 countries and we work across sectors. So we work in health, education, civil society, and economic development. And so um, we have been big advocates for taking integrated approaches because the challenges we face are not one dimensional. They're multi-dimensional and they call for comprehensive approaches. Um, when I think of the SDGs and how they're going to advance health equity, I see the critical piece is achieving universal health care. And I, I like to um, reference that to where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So in 1978, there was the Alma-Ata Declaration which, was, which established primary health care as the agenda for the global, for the international community and the agenda for health. And last year, the WHO, well, and that agenda has really guided us ever since. So for 40 years, that's been the guiding <coughs> framework for um, efforts in health. And while the, um, that declaration and that agenda certainly had policy and financing pieces to it. It was primarily aimed at a clinical kind of work and health system strengthening. And that's a lot of the funding still is on that track of looking at how do we do health system strengthening, how do we train personnel, it's looking at, at how do we introduce new therapies. Um, but looking forward, we're seeing a real shift. And I really think we have moved from, from the era of primary health care to the era of universal health care. And, and that was um, just last month at the UN, uh, Secretary General Guterres um, announced that this was the most important <coughs> consensus uh, in, the, in the global community around health since Alma Ata. So there's a new agenda now that's going to guide health into the future, and it is one that's based on equity. But it, there's an interesting um, distinction from where we've been, which was more biomedical, more health system strengthening, building out infrastructure, to the universal health care agenda. While it has those elements are in it, 
It's really about health financing. That's what the game is to achieve UHC. And if you look at how do you achieve that, how, what, what does that health financing picture look like, it, it's a combination of public and private sector financing. Whereas the primary healthcare agenda was more on the public side, the UHC agenda is, is much more of a hybrid <coughs> model. That it still requires the public piece, and sometimes I worry that we're losing sight of that, but it's got to have the private piece, and we see it in terms of biomedical companies, tech companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, playing a much more outsized role in how we're going to achieve that objective of universal health care. And let me just give one example, Please. and then I'll stop, which is from Ghana, and it's a program FHI 360 worked, worked on, where um, we worked with Novartis, a pharmaceutical company, to pilot an idea about increasing the, the early diagnosis and treatment of hypertension because hypertension, it's a non-communicable disease, is a growing um, epidemic within Africa. So we worked with Novartis and we, the idea was to have the diagnosis done not at a doctor's <coughs> office, but at, um, at a, these small scale pharmacies called licensed chemical dealers or LCDs. So they're not even um, full scale uh, um, pharmacies, they're like drug sellers in a at a community level. And the idea was to train LCDs the, to, to test for hypertension and then be able to refer people if they needed treatment or if they were at an early stage to, to provide treatment advice right there at the LCD shop. Now that was a very successful pilot. It, we found that it increased early diagnosis by about 40% in the country, in the areas that, that we were uh, testing in, and we did it in a, in a rigorous way so that we could, we, you know, we had real evidence of, of how this intervention was working. But then we ran into a problem in terms of scaling it to the country, which was the insurance, the national insurance scheme did not allow for reimbursement to LCDs. It would reimburse diagnosis of hypertension, but only to, to doctors in licensed medical facilities. So that resulted in us having a financing issue and an insurance issue that we had to deal with. And it led to um, months of negotiation with the national insurance company, but we got the change. I mean, I mean not just us, but you know, our, uh, partnership with Novartis, us, and, and working with the Ministry of Health, we were able to get a change in the policy that allows now for licensed chemical dealers to be reimbursed for that <coughs> diagnosis and treatment of hypertension. And that for me is an illustration of what the future is going to look like. Insurance is going to be right at the center. It's going to require a lot of private sector intervention, and it's going to require creative ways of thinking about how we retool the system. Great, great. You don't often hear at a global health event, insurance companies will save the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a hopeful transition, and obviously on the shift to the private sector, it's, 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 uh, it creates a good segue. So Melissa, one thing I left out from your biography is this was, the SDGs were in your remit in government. So now you're in the position to bring a different set of tools and financing to move those forward. Yeah. How are you embracing this inclusive approach? What is, it, what is AB and Bev doing differently? Yeah. Um, when I was part of the very large United yeah. States team that worked on negotiation, the sustainable development goals. So they were very personal to me. And um, when I left the government a year and a half ago, um, it was very important to me that I go to a company that embraced them and saw that these were not check the box activities, these were not isolated 17 separate little things to say, oh yes, I'm doing that, but that really integrated it um, into what they were doing. And although I certainly enjoyed beer many times, I <laughs> knew nothing about it. Um, and when I looked and studied not just the company, but beer and how beer is made, 
it was already a natural through line. Beer is 95% water. And so of the 500 brands that AB and Bev makes, you've heard of almost none of them because we source locally. We get our water locally, we get our crops locally, we produce it locally, and rarely does it leave the country. Um, and so that means that we have to have clean, healthy water sources. We have to have farmers that are empowered, that provide the best crops. We have to have healthy environments in which people are thriving and able to purchase and participate, not just um, in the production of it, but in the enjoyment of it. And then comes the SDGs. And we were already doing these things, but what the SDGs gave was a framework and a direction to what was already doing. Um, at the UN General Assembly recently, Administrator for UNDP, Akeem Steiner, had, had made a comment that brands are global citizens and brands have an obligation to pursue agendas. And it really resonated with me because people are very loyal to their brands, of most things, and especially their beer brands. And we understand this. And we understand that we, as the largest beer producer in the world, have a huge footprint. And we are able to use our scale to change things. And we have an obligation. So Budweiser, for instance, made a commitment and is now made with 100% renewable energy. And it's driving that. And it's important in driving that throughout the rest of the company. Stella has partnered with water.org and has made a commitment in supplying water to those needed throughout Africa. Corona has taken on the issue of plastics in the ocean. And so the company has been empowered by the SDGs to go more and go further. And it, when it comes to the equity piece, um, we created our um, sustainable development goals internally for agriculture by 2025. And we've committed to making our farmers, who we, we directly source with our small Older farmers. We don't do others, and we're very unique in that, but to make them connected, empowered, and financially empowered as well. And so that means not only are we providing them with training and skill set, but we are giving them the financial tools so that they are seen within the supply chain. They have credit that they can track. And this empowers them to have the ability to get medical care and treatment that they might not have been able to do otherwise because now they have a history. Um, and it's an amazing thing. And this is predominantly women farmers, um, predominantly women smallholder farmers. And it's an amazing to see how this one piece um, has allowed them access to credit, which they've never even had before. But then also where um, this framework and really giving us the permission to go further, and you said, you know, you had a conversation over a beer. Well, colleagues of ours, mine had conversations over a beer too about what is left over when beer is made. This grains that we'd been giving to the farmers down the road to feed their cattle for years. Um, and through a grant from the European Union five years ago, we investigated and found out that this is an incredible protein source, a vegetable protein. Um, it is barley protein. And we finally have figured out a way, and we spent five years, and we're getting ready, we'll be ready by February. We are able to get the barley protein out. And it is uh, more water soluble than soy, it's more water soluble than pea, it's not taking up any extra land, any extra water, and it's an incredible nutrition source. And there's a huge need for not just vegetable or um, plant based protein, but we're getting more and more people who are malnourished and undernourished. And through this, we now have the ability to help provide nutrition um, to those who are needing it throughout um, our supply chain and the communities which we're in. Great, great. Um, so you each lay out a very powerful vision, the inclusive approach. You talk about nutrition and agriculture and employment and development and its role in supporting health generally, but also in terms of advancing those communities. You talked about health, health for all and its continuation and supporting broad health systems and the different elements that need to get pulled into that. And you talked about electric electrification and its role in health. Uh, really embracing the inclusiveness of the SDGs. The challenge that we have, of course, is that we're 11 years out and we're a long way from keeping uh, pace with the ambitious goals that we have. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation just put out their Goalskeeper report. According to them, two thirds of children in low and middle income countries will not achieve the SDG for child mortality. On non-communicable diseases, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular <laughs> diseases, premature deaths have actually gone up since 2012 by 
Mm -hmm. uh, so if anything, we're going in the opposite direction. So with limited time and limited resources and these ambitious goals, we have to start thinking about prioritization. How do we, what do we prioritize and how do we do that in a way that doesn't lose what's unique about the SDGs, which is this focus on equity and inclusiveness? Please. So this is gonna sound a little bit boring, but I think it's really an accurate answer, at least from my perspective, um, to this question. I think <clears throat> we have to keep the focus on health system strengthening. And I say that as a priority because, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing, addressing roads and water and all the other things I talked about before, but in terms when you asked about priorities in health and achieving these goals, these targets within the health SDG three, um, it's the center, it's the anchor of everything that can go wrong in, um, in, these, in these countries. There's conflict, there's Ebola, there are shocks to the system all the time. We could say, oh, Ebola, pandemics, we've got to chase that, or we've got to chase um, infant mortality because that's so important. Yes, all of these things are very important, but if you have a weak health system, it can't handle any of that. And we need resilient health systems. So to keep the focus there as a priority, I think we have to do. And I mean, it will, handle, it will help us handle all those shocks and things around the corner like NCDs as people are living longer and the NCDs are, are now a major issue. Diabetes is an issue. So we have to have resilient systems to handle shocks but also to see what's around the corner like NCDs trouble around the corner. The other priority that's in line with that is financing, which Patrick alluded to. This is key, it's a key part of health system strengthening. And when we think about financing, a lot of times what we're talking about is how do we get more of it? How do we get more of it? Yes, we need more of it. You'll hear about the, the gap uh, that, that still exists. That how, what's the size? <coughs> Trillions. Trillions. Trillions, okay, in meeting the SDGs. Yes, that is true, and we can crowd private capital in, and we're all trying to do that, we try to do that. However, just working on the ground, I would say what's really, really important is the efficiency of the financing we've got. So some of these new tools on financing, the results-based financing, and we have developed a development impact bond around this. There are lots of debates around those tools, but they're on the right track because what they're focused on is efficiency towards results. And what we're talking about with SDGs are results. So if we can channel the funding with mechanisms like development impact bonds in the US, similar thing as SIBs, um, that's what I think is priority. Great, so. great. So Patrick, uh, Ruth is speaking your language on yeah. uh, financing <laughs> in UHC, so that's terrific. I wanna pull out, you, you raised a great point about public sector and specifically on UHC, because Ruth mm -hmm. has talked a bit about the private sector element of it. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, maintaining and building a health system needs to be led by to the country and its government. How do you, what do we prioritize on advancing this health for all goal that you had that doesn't just start to draw from the private sector but also increases the accountability and empowers governments to, to lead on health system strengthening too? Um. Well, I think the future is, uh, one, I think that I agree with Ruth that health system strengthening is a critical building block. Um, I think the reality is going to be that it's going to be very situational, and it will depend on the country what, what, the, what that looks like. But that in growth economies, which are many of the economy, including in poor countries, but many of them are in the growth trajectory, I think it, it, we're going to see a hybrid system. And that hybrid system, in order to get strong health systems that do address equity, that it's going to be a combination of both private provision and public provision. And the, the challenge I think we have from a, a policy point of view is around creating the policy environment and the incentives that allow us to get the balance right that brings in investment, private investment, into, into a country and, and doesn't then slack off on the public investment because that's what I've seen in some places where um, governments which are strapped will, if, if, if the private investment increases, then it provides them a, a 
a way to reduce their public investment or, or maybe not grow it in the way that it needs to, to be grown. So um, that's one point, that getting the balance right. But I do think that we're going to see hybrid systems. And then in countries that are beset by conflict or by complex emergencies, um, there I think it's going to continue to be more a combination of external, fa external finance. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have finance from the UN, from the World Bank, from bilateral donors from countries like the US and others, and these new countries that are coming you know, from China, from, um, uh, from India, uh, from Brazil. So new <coughs> donors entering um, into the, inter playing, playing new roles in the international community, and we haven't really integrated them. They're not integrated, and mm -hmm. it's not clear they want to be integrated. But if we're going to, you know, we talk about the need for integrated services, we also need to integrate the finance. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big challenge that we face within the global community because there's tremendous resources there. And if you look at what China's doing in, in Africa, it, it's making huge contributions that um, are, you know, in some cases they're not well understood by the West and we criticize them. In some cases we feel threatened by them because they're competitive. Yeah. I look at some of the, the countries I travel in, I look at um, <coughs> the increased infrastructure that China has financed and I think, you know, if I lived in this country, I'd see that as a pretty good thing. Um, so. Um, so I think it's going to be a pretty uh, mixed kind of uh, si situation that is context driven. I do think that in terms of you know what are we going to be focusing on, it's going to be on NCDs. So the burden of disease has shifted from infectious diseases to non-communicable diseases. And um, obesity in particular. Yeah is a pandemic. It is growing. Uh, places like Africa and parts of uh, Southeast Asia, actually most countries in the world that um, are emerging with growth economies are just sitting ducks for this. They don't recognize it as, a, as an epidemic and we're not tooled to address it. And obesity is the mother of hypertension and diabetes. Diabetes has increased four times in terms of prevalence since 1980, and we're going to see that go up. And right now, you know, interestingly, with infectious diseases, which is what we've been focused on uh, for the last 40 years, the um, the approach is a biomedical approach, and it lends itself to public finance because. People are scared, hey, I can catch that from you, and there needs to be a public response to protect the public. With this pandemic of obesity and its offspring, diabetes and hypertension, those are viewed as lifestyle choices. They're viewed as individual responsibility. And so they don't e elicit the same kind of public response and there's, they create controversy about who really should be responsible for addressing this. And is it just your problem that you're drinking too much soda? So, uh, you know, the public shouldn't be responsible for your bad lifestyle choices? Um, those questions I don't think that we are adequately addressing within uh, discussions in the international community around health. No, and I couldn't agree with you more on that point. Um, one thing you can say, just to draw out a little bit more about what <coughs> might work, one thing you can certainly say about the West and the United States in particular were early adopters of the obesity problem. So what do you think that we might contribute? You mentioned the need to contribute. What do you think we yeah. might contribute uh, to, yeah. to addressing that? I think that the U.S., uh, I mean, here in the U.S., we've seen a lot, uh, we've, you, we've seen a response, yeah. and we've seen things that do work. So uh, I think we have an idea of approaches that work, and FHI 360 has been very involved with uh, CDC, where we have been uh, running their social communication uh, campaign against obesity. Um, and with uh, foundations, private funders like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and its idea of healthy communities. But it, it illustrates, so those social marketing and behavior change communication 
is the response for obesity. So you have to help people change their behaviors and adopt healthy behaviors. What we've learned is it's not enough just to, um, to tell them to do that or hector them to do that or even provide good information that can persuade them to do that because many people are in environments that don't allow them to do it. So that's where you get at the idea of healthy communities that Robert Wood Johnson and others have championed. But that's a much more comprehensive approach. You talk about an integrated approach, that gets at, at, at um, urban planning, how cities are laid out, and creating walking areas so you, you, people live in environments that they need to be more active in. You're not going to be driving to everything. People live in environments where there's not food deserts, where in, in uh, many parts of the US, the cost of, of you know, high calorie, low nutrition, fast food is, is far cheaper than the cost of fruits and vegetables and, and far more accessible. So addressing those kinds of environmental issues about how do we live, how do we organize our, our, uh, our communities, that's so much more difficult than approaching it from it's your individual problem and here's a pill. To take, and that's kind of the track we're on right now. So there, I think there's a a, a real um, important <laughs> uh, there, there's there's a, a long journey to make. We, I think we know what to do, or we have good ideas about things that should be done, but to get the public financing and to get the public support for making those shifts is difficult, and it's politically controversial. Absolutely. Um, so Melissa, you've been patient, thank you. In terms of, uh, we are in an environment where we haven't made the progress that people had hoped for with the launch of the SCGs and all the work that you and your government colleagues had done to try to support that process. How, how is AB InBev thinking about rebalancing or prioritizing? You mentioned much of it already reaffirmed the approaches that we're taking. Moving forward, what, what do you think now, a few years in, we should be, that you, you as a company, your, your company should be doing differently? You know, the, the SDGs were developed in such a way that they were intentionally um, integrated so that they would force this multi-sectoral work. And in case we forgot that, we made SDG 17 big front and center partnerships. Um, but I think that that gets missed a lot. And when it comes to the private sector, I don't just mean, oh, we're excluded. I mean, with, there's a double-edged sword to things. If you announce, we were talking, Ruth and I were talking about this before, if you are doing something that is advancing the sustainable development goals and you talk about it, because you're proud of it or you want to know if there are others interested, you will often get slapped down, oh, there's not, it's not really, you just did that for the PR or you just did that, you're not really doing it, you're just checking the box. But if you stay quiet about it and do your work, yes, you make progress or advancement on that, but that it stops there. And so one of the things that um, my job and what I'm looking on is we have that own issue internally. You know, the water teams know what it's doing on renewable water, and the climate team knows what it's doing on climate, and our nutrition teams, but they don't even know what each other are doing. And if they don't even know what they're doing internally, how do I expect a person on the street to equate and understand what AB and Bev is doing holistically on the SDGs? And I think what we really need private sector to do is stop being afraid to talk about what they're doing, because we're all only gonna make this much progress if we aren't partnering with each other and if we're not scaling it up. And not only that, we don't have all the answers. Um, and I think governments, I think to some degree there's some pride. Oh, I, I did this on my own. But there is no pride if we don't get there. there. There's no glory in going for the effort but not making it, but I tried. I mean, the UN uh, um, started the decade of action this year because we've got 10 years and we are very far away. Um, and so there's some doubling down on, okay, how are we gonna get there? And there's no way not to agree with what you both said, absolutely. Um, but I, again, I think that everyone doesn't know what each other's doing. And you've got different people, NGOs, private sector government in the same space doing the same thing, but they don't even know it. And if they were more vocal about what they were doing, they might make 
far greater progress in working together. But we, we work in our silos, I think, a lot of it's pride. We are proud of what we are doing and we are accomplishing. The pride's not gonna get us there. Great, great. Let me stay with you on the, on the private sector side. Um, uh, probably, perhaps like other people, uh, I can't think of the last global health event that I've gone to where there hasn't been controversy mm -hmm. around the engagement of the private sector in global health programs. This is particularly okay. true for companies that uh, market and sell potentially health harming products. Mm -hmm. So the Global Fund, uh, its partnership with Heineken was a source of great controversy and has really driven a conversation in general in global health mm -hmm. about w when should we partner with the private sector in general? Is it okay to partner with them on areas where they, they have a commercial interest or should they uh, be left out or reserved for only other areas? We mentioned before the lack of progress on, on um, uh, NCDs. Uh, the University of Washington's Global Burden of Disease Project said as of 2016, alcohol is now the leading uh, health risk source of attributable deaths for 15 to 49 year olds, so preventable deaths. Mm -hmm. How do you think of is there a seat for AB and Bev at the table on the SDGs? Should it be in connection to matters related to alcohol, or should it just be reserved to other areas? Um, thank you. I mean, it's the, probably the elephant in the room, and I have absolutely no problem addressing it. Uh, just very briefly, just to comment on the, the global fund piece, you know, we are by no means Heineken, and I'm, I'm not going to comment on what Heineken did, but what it did do is force us to look internally. You know, and what we realized is that we did not have a universal um, human rights policy, and that was unacceptable. And mm -hmm. so, again, in, in using the SDGs and examples that were out there, we now developed and are in, uh, in the middle of impl implementing um, a progressive human rights policy throughout the company. But as for your other question about, you know, should we have a seat at the table in other places? Two weeks ago, we just had our, um, a dialogue with the WHO for economic operators in the space of alcohol, specifically to talk about all of these issues and, and how we can work together and, and of course, the concept of, of, of conflict of interest. But the SDGs are extraordinarily specific. It is the harmful use of alcohol. And for those who don't drink or, or do drink, it, the, the SDG is about how do we reduce the harmful use of the product. And anyone who is in anything to do with the production of alcohol has a responsibility to work on that because it is your product that is affecting this. So um, from this standpoint, there is no way governments or NGOs are ever gonna get to that goal by themselves mm -hmm. without involving the producers and the distributors and the sellers of the product. Um, but there's another role that, that um, you know, so. Uh, as a company, we aligned, uh, we created the smart drinking goals to align with the WHO. And we have implemented 10 city pilots as kind of incubators to put in policies, procedures to reduce the harmful use of alcohol by 10% um, in these 10 pilot cities, hoping to then replicate that globally. In, a, in, in the US? No, one of them is Columbus, Ohio, is the city in the United States. Mm -hmm. No, it's globally. So mm -hmm. um, it's 10 cities globally. Columbus, Ohio is the one in the United States. Um, and to use data and empirical data to, to, to test, because we do have that ability as the private sector to try things out mm -hmm. and fail and, um, and not have to talk our citizens quite the yeah. same way and try and, and try again. And so we've aligned to that. Um, we also, in the, in the countries where we operate, we're the number one or the number two users of roads. And so we have an obligation, our, our CEO truly believes we have an obligation not just to our workers, but to the communities we're in, to how can we participate in the reduction of tra traffic fatalities, which is a health goal. Um, and so again, we've been working, um, developing models to look at what are the actual contributors of road fatalities in specific areas and how can, can we replicate this. But it's a matter of, I truly believe there's no such thing as not having a conflict of interest. I don't care your industry, your political affiliation, your sexual orientation, your religion, there is going to be a conflict of interest and the issue is how can it be managed? And is the issue, the situation you're putting yourself in, is it manageable or not? And maybe the answer is no. 
No, I'm sorry, like, this one is just way too obvious that it's going to, the decision made here absolutely affects your bottom line. Okay, maybe in that case it's not, but the fact that the product contributes does not mean you don't have a seat. It means you absolutely <coughs> should be involved because it's your responsibility. So I think that the question really is, how do you manage a conflict of interest? And this is something that's been going back and forth in particular within the UN system for the last year with really no great answer um, because it's not black and white. I wish life were that easy. You know, um, I just don't think it is. And I think the real question is, what's the greater good? Is, is this working with this entity, this private sector company, this NGO, whoever it is, is the greater good bigger and more valuable than this conflict of interest piece, whatever it is. And again, you have to debate it. But each, sometimes the answer is going to be yes. Sometimes it's going to be no. But when it's yes, um, I think that that is what you need to hold on to um, and realize that you are working towards something bigger than, than this other piece. Great, great. That's really helpful. Um, so one of the big pushes uh, around uh, consumer products in this category in general is whether or not uh, government should be more empowered on fiscal measures or should be advertising and so forth. Is that, is that a conversation that yes. your company should be involved in? Or when it gets down to which tool they should be pursuing, um, that really mm -hmm. should be left to the government itself? As a group of brewers, we met with the uh, IMF um, twice over the last year. And what was amazing to us to find that the small group of individuals we met with were responsible for the entire world. And we have access to data that they didn't. And we had the ability to supply them with you know, verified data that, was, that they didn't have. And they were grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And what we were showing with this data, again, just to be very transparent, we have never advocated for no taxes. In fact, our company pays over $15 billion in excise taxes. But so that's not something that we are, you know, are trying to advocate against. But what we are trying to advocate is you need to have the data in order to make your policy decisions. And what we're finding is that they don't. And where um, governments have a responsibility, I feel, is being thoughtful and not knee-jerk reaction in their fiscal policies. And when it comes to alcohol, the worst form of alcohol is illicit alcohol. I mean, look at cases of India and Dominican Republic and the deaths that occurred this year with illicit alcohol. And when prices go too high, you're pushing in that, that place. Fiscal policy has the ability to nudge consumers into lower alcohol and non-alcohol products. And that's where you want to see. I mean, there are plenty of countries out there that have still to this day no tax in, taxation on wine. Wine somehow seems to be privileged and reserved. It's still an alcohol product. And there are places in the world where, you know, vodka is far cheaper than a can of beer. Fiscal policy can help nudge consumers to that lower alcohol. And that's, again, where I think we need to be asking our health ministers and our finance ministers to talk because they often don't. And if they work together, then hopefully they can use fiscal policies towards that you know, health equity agenda. Great. Uh, for, for both of you, and we only have a, a minute or so before we need to turn over to the audience, but if you could say something about how you, you've talked a little bit already about pulling in private financing, you've talked a little bit about pulling in insurance and other industries that people may not think of as global health advancing. Where, where, what have, what's left on the table? What are we, which industries are we not pulling in? Is it the, people talk about the fitness industry, people talk about some other industries that haven't really been a big part of global health necessarily? or the SDG conversation? Where do you see the opportunities? Can I make a really quick point Please. on that? First of all, I would love to get the fitness industry involved, mm -hmm. and that is like my personal mission, but um, that's another thing. But um, just a really quick point, and then I'll turn it over to you, Patrick. But I think, and as observed, that there is a lot that the private sector companies and investors are already contributing to the SDGs that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. I just heard about several more examples from Melissa just now, and I hear about them every day, and we partner with people like this, but I can't keep up. So 
what I would say is a lot of people don't know how much the private sector is already doing, and they don't advertise it. Sometimes it might be because they're shy to advertise it, but sometimes they're not thinking about the SDGs. They're just doing business on the ground, and they are making contributions to SDGs and improving health care um, without advertising it. So I think a real service we could provide, perhaps, um, the UN could do this, is create a registry that the private sector could list what it's doing and, and become more aware of this. It would help us all partner and know who to partner with. And I'll just leave it there. Great. So I, I want to go back to something. You, you asked the question, sh should the private sector be at the table? And I absolutely think they must be at the table because they're, one of the, they're, they're the main actor in our, in our society. They drive economic growth or economic decline. Mm -hmm. So they've got to be at the table. To get to your <coughs> point about, well, should they be at the table when we're talking about regulation? Maybe not, but what I'd like to see is the private sector take leadership without being regulated. Mm -hmm. I wanna, I've seen industries where they have, a, they have a real impact on global health, and instead of really stepping out and providing leadership on, like breastfeeding is a good example, mm -hmm. the, the breast milk substitute producers, um, for, for a long time, their commitment really was to profit. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there was tremendous advocacy around we need industry to provide leadership so that these products aren't marketed to vulnerable women who are, who, who, whose health it's going to harm, women and children whose health it's going to harm. Now, we're seeing that change. And in just the last few years, we've seen some real progress from some of the major um, manufacturers that goes beyond the PR exercise. I mean, it's real. And that is because they've been at the table. So uh, I am a strong advocate that even in for, for uh, industries where we have real concerns about whether that uh, industry or that company is playing a positive or a negative role, that um, rather than taking an, uh, an approach of ostracizing them, we need to take an approach to uh, engage them and, to, um, and to, to encourage them to put health above profit. And there's a really um, encouraging uh, development just last month from the Business Roundtable where you had, a, I think, 163 CEOs who signed this pledge that um, business, the business community's commitment needs to be more than a commitment to its shareholders. It needs to be a commitment to society because of the role they play. And that, that moves, that was the first really uh, definitive movement towards putting social need or social good um, on a closer par with profit. Yeah. And I know for, at a, for businesses in the boardroom, or if you're the director of a, of a business unit and you're being, um, your performance is being assessed on your, the, your profitability or the revenue that you're bringing in or your market penetration, and then uh, you know, an advocate like me is coming and saying, hey, these practices are harming people, so they may be growing your market share, but stop doing them. That's a really tough position for that business manager to be put in. The fact that the business community is, is acknowledging that is a really powerful thing, and it's something we need to encourage. Yeah. Uh, did your CEO yeah. sign that? Did in all, I, I know we're running short, but I, I just want to um, respond to that because much to our competitors' chagrin, we have done exactly what you've said. We have partnered with Tufts University to look at the labeling issue. What could we actually put on a bottle, a can, that would actually have an impact you know, we have the black lungs on cigarettes and people just ignore them in your path. I mean, just what would actually be meaningful and how do you adapt it for the community? You know, we were talking to some colleagues um, from the Botswana government and they're like, driving and drinking is not our issue here. It's drunk walking. 
That is a huge, we have more fatalities from people drinking and walking than we're ever going to. So how do you make a label that actually is going to impact someone's health awareness and choices? And so we've made a commitment to not only developing, but having these labels on all of our bottles by 2025, ahead of any international regulation. And our, like I said, our, competitive, our procurement team is furious because it's not going to be cheap because they have to figure out how to get this new label with everything else. But to your point, we're an alcohol company, and we have an obligation to make sure that our product is used safely. That's great to hear. And one of the things that I, I know, argued just need to you turn over. Here too. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. And I'm glad it's a lively conversation. But, um, and I am deeply curious what the uh, don't, uh, don't walk while drinking label looks like. But we will forego that conversation for a moment. And I want to turn it over to you. If you uh, wave your hand frantically, I will call on you and a mic will come around to you. And just say your name and, and where you're coming from. Hi, I'm um, Catherine Connolly. I'm a dual MPH MBA student at Hopkins. Um, and I'm interested in global health. And, and my question is, um, right now we um, see a lot more engagement in the private sector, which is really encouraging. But we also see a trend towards focusing on local ownership and local partnership. Um, and funding from that side. I'd love to hear sort of from all of you how you're um, working with local entities to drive programs and really be the leaders rather than sort of the implementers or followers. I'm happy to do that. Um, that is a great and very pertinent question. It's really easy. Sometimes when we get up here, we talk about us, 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 and, we're, you know, and actually a lot of the things we're talking about are locally driven. Mm -hmm. um, so the example that I gave in northern Nigeria, that was actually a locally driven um, if, um, initiative. Uh, so, and, and when we talk about the private sector, I think it's also important to keep in mind that there is a very vibrant local private sector when it comes to health, and they are a key part of the health system. They're not separate from the health system. So um, we work very closely with them and are very inclusive and listen to both sides. It's not just public side of the health system, but it's also the private sector because they are providing a lot of services and what people often don't understand when they hear the word private sector about local private sector is they think only rich people can go there. And that is actually not at all true. There are a lot of very small, affordable clinics, and they are often the ones, because of their geographic footprint, that are providing <laughs> services in the hard-to-reach areas. And, um, and so, sometimes more affordable services. And sometimes, exactly, because there are a lot of under-the-table payments. There are a lot of these things we never really get a chance to talk about. And so I just wanted to make sure we understand that when we're listening to what's going on on the ground and we're listening to um, what's needed, uh, we are talking to both sides of the health system um, when we're listening. And also to the um, people themselves, patients. So we, we work with youth a lot, um, and I don't want to hog the stage, so I'll turn it over to you really fast. But, yeah. but, it, but yeah. I realize I'm talking about um, local providers, yeah. but it's also listening to the patients. And youth are a really good example. We have a lot of youth-friendly services that we um, try to develop, and you can't make them youth friendly unless the youth are telling you what makes it friendly for them. So we design um, centers um, with their input, and they tell us what to do. Um, we realized, um, I mean, this is a critical question, and you know, anyone in development knows the goal is never to stay. Your goal is to not be needed and, and, and to get out. And, and bringing that kind of same mentality is that you know we're in 150 different countries and we don't know what all the issues are. So we put a challenge out there and we asked our business units both um, to present us what their challenges were, but they also asked their, the communities. And then we put out um, a, a global challenge where, where companies from uh, across the regions could write, you know, apply if they thought they could address any of these issues that were at hand. And we made sure and we provided um, mentoring and also seed money to address things like in Peru, dry toilets. Um, and to address things um, as unsexy as this, this product that is needed to clean the inside of, um, of, of our brewing facilities was really you know, toxic. And a company was able to make one that you, know, you could eat it if you wanted to. It was gross, but like completely, <laughs> but, you know. So we, and in doing this, they took not only local ownership of the problems, 
but it in exchange not only for that but allowed this company to then again test and um, to scale up their own their own programs yeah we're a very decentralized organization so we have country offices and regional offices and our, our um, uh, staff are really integrated into the fabric of the communities where they work and that has allowed us with respect to the private sector to make investments in the private sector so we've set, we set up uh, a separate subsidiary called ventures where we invest in um, social enterprises and um, we didn't start out, with, when we set it up, we didn't start out to focus exclusively on health. We were looking for early stage social enterprises that were, could make a contribution to their communities. But uh, we've made nine investments over two years, and uh, seven of those are firmly in the health sector, and one of them is sort of tangentially in the health sector. But that's a very direct kind of, when you talk about you know, the shift to local, um, that's a very you know, direct engagement with the local private sector to support <coughs> the growth of uh, innovative ideas that can meet needs at the community level. Great. Uh, so we have three minutes left, so I'm gonna try to call on multiple people and then we'll uh, spread out the question. So do make your question short and make it sound like a question. Please. Okay, well mine is a comment and a question, so maybe I'll save it for later. Okay. I saw you next. Sorry, well then we'll... <laughs> a question. Third time to time. Um, you talked about risks of uh, NCDs and obesity. Uh, can you talk about any countries um, in uh, the developing world that are uh, doing a really good job in terms of you know, creating a strategy or piloting different um, uh, programs to address this? Great, each of you have one minute to give your favorite example of a low and middle income country making, making progress on NCDs. I don't know of a single example on obesity, They're, they might be out there, but we work in a lot of countries, and what I see is that that pandemic is getting worse and worse, and that the, both the public health authorities and the public at large, public you know, opinion, um, doesn't recognize it as the kind of danger that it represents. In fact, in a lot of African countries, you know, they s still see being overweight as, a, as a, you know, something, a, a, a sign of health. Prosperity. Good thing. Right, and you know, to you compliment somebody by saying, hey, you look fat. <laughs> That's <Yeah. laughs> I can give you an example. Um, I had to think about this one, though. Um, so Pacific Island cervical cancer is very, it's one of the top killers of women. <clears throat> And the region has come together to develop a regional strategy around cervical cancer. And you have never seen so many donors in one small place. Um, but there, everyone is fighting to get in there and help, including ourselves. So yeah, yeah a lot, lot of movement, a lot of interest, because it can be wiped out in, in the Pacific Islands with the mm -hmm. right effort. Mm -hmm. Great. Last minute, Melissa. Um, the WHO did a report um, showing that the number of uh, deaths from alcohol has decreased in Europe. Um, and the reasoning for this was there was a large switch um, due to fiscal policies from spirits to beer and lower alcohol products. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Europe, at least, on when it comes to deaths from, from alcohol, we're seeing a, a decrease. Great. Um, well, this has a, been a terrific session. Mm -hmm. I hope you will join me in thanking your speakers. Those of you that had comments, just to say, please come up to the stage and provide them. Um, I'm sure the speakers would love to engage with you. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.